Hello and good evening to everyone. My name is Rima Dial and I'm the general manager for WSHU Public Radio. And it is absolutely my pleasure to welcome you this evening to our Join the Conversation series. I'm geeky excited to learn more about climate change, what's going on right now, and what can we all do to come up with great solutions for our community. So I'd like to turn it over to my good friend and colleague, a senior director of news and education, Terry Sheridan. Terry, take it away and let's talk about our great partnership that we have with Solutions Journalism Network and the Climate Beacon Initiative. Well, thank you, Rima. Uh, we are extremely proud to be one of nine outlets to be selected to participate in the inaugural Solutions Journalism Network's Climate Beacon. This year, WSHU is focusing on climate, co climate coverage. For instance, Janice Roman and all of our beats were doing this. Janice Roman, who is our Indigenous Nations reporter, is looking at how Indigenous nations, both in Connecticut and Long Island, are dealing with the climate crisis. Desiree Diorio, our military and veterans reporter, is looking at how training from West Point to the local National Guard is changing because of the climate uh, emergency. And then one of the things I'm looking forward to her doing is what happens when a submarine base goes underwater. You know, that is a serious issue, even though we may make light of it. We at WSHU feel that we're up for this challenge. Our podcast, Higher Ground, our climate podcast, uh, hosted by J.D. Allen and produced by Sabrina Garone, was awarded uh, the Science Communication Award from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine last year. As part of the Climate Beacon, we'll be focusing on Long Island Sound and the Long Island Sound watershed. And we will be engaging with communities that we have underserved over the years, communities of color around the sound. We want to bring them to the table. We want to hear their fears. We want to hear their concerns. And we want them to be part of the solution, to be a full stakeholder as we go forward with this Climate Beacon work. Tonight's host is longtime WSHU reporter Davis Donovan. You might know him from his longtime podcast, Off the Path. And uh, to humble brag a moment, uh, Davis's podcast, the WSHU podcast, Still Newtown, that he conceived and hosted, has recently been nominated for a Peabody Award, one of the highest honors in broadcasting that uh, a show or a station can receive. So with that, I'd like to introduce Davis Donovan. And Davis, take it away. Well, thanks, Terry. And uh, thanks, everyone. For, uh, for joining us. I'm, I'm honored to be here with two experts. I'm, I'll be moderating their conversation. And I'm, I'm going to sit back and enjoy, uh, so to speak, hearing what they have to say. I'm, I, I can't wait to get their perspective on, on this important issue. I'm here with uh, first Dr. Uh, Erica Freimuth is a scientist who serves as a writer and editor focused on Climate Central's Climate Matters program. Previously, she worked as a scientific editor at Cell Press, uh, where she helped launch a scientific journal publishing original research and expert commentary on global environmental change. Uh, she earned her PhD in geology at the University of Cincinnati and a BS in Earth Science Systems Science at Cornell University. Hope I got all that right, Erica. Uh, and Erica, thanks for joining us. It's a real honor to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so pleased to be here with you all. Uh, I'd like to uh, also introduce Michael Korn. Michael is a, a journalist who writes the Climate Coach Advice column for the Washington Post. He spent the previous two decades as a reporter and editor covering climate technology and economics for outlets such as Quartz, CNN.com. He has a BS in environmental studies and journalism from Emory University and a master's in environmental science from Yale University. Michael, thanks for being here. Pleasure. Thanks. So I'd like to, in very brief, I just gave a quick bio, which is so hard to sum up the work that we do. I'd like to ask each of you, in brief, your what perspective on, on what you bring to this uh, Erica, what is it that that you do at Climate Matters? We could start with you. Tell us a little bit about where your work has led has led you. Yeah, of course. Um, so as you mentioned, I have a scientific background. Uh, my expertise is in paleoclimate, so understanding how the Earth's climate has changed at various points in the past, um, at what rates and for what reasons, um, to better sort of anticipate what we can expect in the future in our warming world. Um, and I, I 
loved doing primary research, being in the lab, doing field work, but um, I really wanted to transition my career out of academia uh, and to engage more and communicate more um, at this time uh, during our, you know, during this climate crisis that we're all living through. Um, and I, I'm very passionate about making science uh, accessible uh, to as broad an audience as possible. And that's what Climate Central is such a such a wonderful organization. Uh, Climate Central has been around since about 2008, uh, researching and communicating um, the science of climate change and how it's imp impacting people's lives and things they care about um, in, in, their, in their daily lives. So uh, we often hear about global climate change as this far off abstract global phenomenon, um, but people are, increasingly realizing that it's affecting us um, in our local communities in ways that uh, are inequitable and uh, in, in ways that could be accelerating in the future. And so the Climate Matters program that, um, that my work is focused on is really dedicated to highlighting using data uh, highlighting the local impacts of climate change. So how are the, the global trends that we're seeing around the world playing out across the US. Um, so the Climate Matters program provides weekly articles um, and local data analysis that accompany those articles that explore the impacts of climate change locally, but also the solutions. So what can we do about climate change? Um, how, can we, how can we address um, and avoid some of the worst impacts? So um, in my work at Climate Matters, I'm the managing editor and lead writer. So I, I write the weekly content that accompanies our data analysis and our, our local graphic sets, which are free um, and accessible for anyone to, uh, to use and explore, um, including local graphics for Connecticut um, and various locations throughout New York. Great. Well, thank you so much, Erica. And uh, solutions, of course, are what we're here to talk about. Michael, I'd like to hear a little bit about what it means to be a, the climate coach. What is your approach? Um, I'm the first climate coach at the Washington Post. So uh, we, we, we just have been trying to figure out what exactly that looks like. But I think the goal when we first started was people had a lot of questions. How about not only how they live their lives, but about how they can intersect um, with systematic change around climate. And I don't, there were, there were a lot of sort of, I think, very facile answers out there, you know, mile wide, inch deep. And then there were a lot of, a lot of technical, um, I think, reports, um, but there wasn't much that bridged the gap. And so uh, in my role at The Post, we're trying to answer questions that people have about the way they live their lives, um, you know, what what really has an impact, and then how they can, um, you know, have a, a how they can affect meaningful change uh, in their own communities and at their at their homes and their businesses and um, and more broadly. So uh, right now, that's that's kind of the approach we're taking. It's uh, I would say accessible, but also very data driven. I uh, appreciate. You know, we're gonna. I think we want to dig into that a little bit more. You said mile wide, inch deep, you know, and I think we want to dig a little deeper than an inch uh, to think about how we can affect meaningful change. So uh, both of you, I, I think are, uh, it's going to be great to hear you talk through this. The name of this talk is sort of, is um, uh, what's going on and what can we do? So I think we need to take a moment to acknowledge what's going on. Uh, earlier this year, we learned from a UN climate change report that we may be less than 10 years away from the threshold necessary to keep warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the Washington Post headline reads, a world is on the brink of catastrophic warming. A dangerous climate threshold is near, but it does not mean we are doomed. That's a quote. It does not mean we are doomed if swift action is taken. So I'd like to ask if both of you can Help us unpack these headlines. What is the situation right now as you see it? Um, maybe we could uh, start with uh, Michael. We started with Erica last time. We can start with Michael this time, especially coming from the post. So the way I think about it and the way that it's been explained to me by climate modelers is uh, there's good news and bad news here. The good news is the worst 
scenarios are likely off the table. So 10 years ago, you know, we had projections that, um, you know, we could hit three, four, five degrees of warming. And that no longer seems, even under business as usual, um, a, a likely outcome. And the reason is that we've seen incredible uh, advancements in renewable energy, uh, emission reduction technology. And while we are moving too slowly, um, we're also moving faster than some of the worst case scenarios. Uh, that said, obviously, 1.5 degrees is slipping out of our grasp, and we're, we're at an inflection point where we actually have most of the technology and, in theory, the funding to get us to a point where, if, while we will not avoid damaging climate change, we may not even avoid catastrophic in some ways, but we can avoid the worst, um, and that is a very attainable goal. Um, so I think... When I think about it, uh, I look at it as a narrowing of the possibilities, but um, still including some at least relatively accept, um, <laughs> better outcomes than, than the ones we, we once thought of. And Eric, if you'd uh, like to pick up on that thread. Um, well, uh, to add to that, um... I, I think there's also a lot to be hopeful about at this moment. Um, and I, I would like to convey to everyone tuning in um, that we all have a lot of agency um, to turn this tide. Um, and Michael's already alluded to the beginnings of that, but there's always more to be done. Um, and I think we're, we're in a moment and in a in a position, and we we live in a country uh, that gives us opportunities to to do so. So um, I think hopefully we can elaborate on some of some of the ways we can do that in this conversation. Yeah. So let's talk about some potential solutions, right? Uh, WSHU is uh, just to mention some of the work that we've done. We're part of the New England News Collaborative. Uh, we've mm -hmm. Uh, been profiling a variety of uh, solutions across the region uh, for Earth Day. Natural burials in Vermont, Silva Pasture in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, we did some reporting here in Connecticut on salt marsh remediation. So I'd like to talk about some of the most promising solutions you've seen on the horizon that we can think about on a local and regional level. You know, as uh, as uh, you said, um, and before, Michael, you know, people are thinking about how we can affect meaningful change. Uh, what is it that we can be doing in our own backyards? And I'll uh, open this question up. I, I want to encourage a, a, a discussion between the two of you. So I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, each of your thoughts on this. Um, Michael, maybe we can uh, start with you on that. Um, so, you know, one of the first things I wrote about was that turning off your light bulbs just isn't what it used to be. It's good that you do it and it's fine not to waste it, but we have all these outdated assumptions like it's 1970 about the way we use energy and what's important. And if you have LEDs in your house, turning off your light bulbs, well, it's a good idea, is a, a rounding error ultimately in the energy you consume. And so I think this is kind of a conception about we should really focus on the things that we have the time and the energy to focus on and have the biggest bang for our buck. And the question is, what are those? Um, and I'm gonna, I guess for a moment, just kind of step away from, you know, we need to fund transmission lines across the United States and we need massive political change because that's true, but it's also something that probably everyday folks uh, just don't have the agency to focus on uh, or have immediate ability to change. Um, although eventually, yes. Um, so I think the way I think about it is there's kind of a hierarchy of impacts that you could have and it's usually your home, transportation and food uh, as three major ones that you can actually have a huge impact on your personal um, emissions or let's say climate impact. And this is important. It's not just sort of the addition and subtraction of your own individual life, but it's actually the example you set, or I should say almost like the, um, the norms that you set by living a certain way in the world uh, or, or, or accepting is actually one of the most powerful things you can do. And so I'm going to be writing some future columns about this, but uh, there's a phrase called norm entrepreneurs. So this is the idea of, are you out there just being a different in a way that creates a new norm that becomes acceptable or cool or desirable? Um, and so we go into some of those details, but, you know, heat pumps and 
uh, even changing, you know, what, what you eat on a daily basis and, and how you deal with uh, waste are all easy things in theory and hard to do because they're not yet socially uh, common or acceptable. You know, I, I really love that idea, norm entrepreneurs, and I'm looking forward to seeing that column. I, Eric, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Do you do you see norm entrepreneurs in the future uh, being a potential? Uh, yeah, I, I do. And I think that there's something that we can all do, and we're kind of doing it right now at this moment, which is talking about climate change. Um, so to Michael's point, you know, there's some really interesting research coming out from the social sciences last year um, and continuing into this year about sort of how we discount how much our neighbors care about climate change. So um, some research coming out of um, Boston University last August um, uh, found some really interesting results. So even though most Americans are concerned about climate change, uh, I think from based on the Yale um, survey data that's been going for about a decade now, about 65% of Americans are actually concerned about climate change. But the finding from this research last August was that um, on average, we think that only 43% of Americans are concerned about climate change. And that's a massive difference because it's the difference between the majority of Americans being concerned about climate change and the minority, right? And we're all social creatures. We want to be accepted. We want to be in the group, right? We want to be in the majority. So I think even just talking about climate change, voicing your concern, voicing your questions, um, normalizing it in conversation, it's something free and accessible that we as individuals can all do um, in our daily lives. So I, I think taking a cue from the social sciences as well and not forgetting that we're all social creatures um, navigating through this together as part of it. You know, one thing uh, I think we, we've heard a lot more of in the past 10 years or so is climate cynicism, right? And both of you have kind of hit on this point a little bit. One thing that I think a lot of people might have missed that you pointed out, Michael, was, you know, there is good news that the worst scenarios are now off the table uh, for uh, climate change. Uh, and, you know, as you just pointed out, Erica, we have a kind of a sounds like a skewed perspective on how we uh, think about uh, our own, as a society, uh, feelings about climate change. So as we're experiencing this kind of climate cynicism, how did we get to this point and how do we combat that feeling that this is doom and gloom, this is hopeless, there is nothing we can do? Uh, how, how do we counter that? So um, I will say there, there, you know, there are, of course, a lot of uncertainty and there are potentially feedback loops or thresholds that we don't know about. And so there are real risks here that we, we need to consider. But in terms, in terms of our emissions, <laughs> it does seem like those scenarios are off the table. You know, I think that cynicism is in many ways as unhelpful as denial uh, in that I think it essentially leads to the same place. And I also don't think it's based on evidence. Um, so, you know, I, I think we got there for understandable reasons in that, you know, the, the news has been bad and the drumbeat has only gotten louder. And it's easy, I think, to, to fall into that trap. Um, but it's, it does take, it does take some courage and some open, you know, it's retaining an open mind that, you know, to update our assumptions about where the world is going based on, on, on where we are. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, 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 it's hard to, it's hard to argue sometimes because it certainly feels that that's the way, but it's, it's also true that in most cases in life, things are not binary. We don't, we don't feel like, oh, if it's either, it's either all or nothing. Um, and in this case, climate change is very much something that's worth fighting for every degree, for every fraction of a degree. And the idea that either we make it or we don't is simply not true. And Erica, yes. Very well put. And I would I would echo all of that, um, uh, especially what Michael just said, every fraction of a degree matters, every fraction of a degree of, of avoided warming, um, every bit of avoided emissions. Um, and also, I, I really hate to hear about um, doom <laughs> sort of, you know, this this doom uh, narrative, because we again, we really do have so much agency in this. Um, we're 
humans are, you know, a primary cause of the climate change that we're seeing now. Um, but we also are the solution, right? And I think one of the really compelling figures that came out from the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change synthesis report um, was this uh, illustration. So it's very like accessible summary diagram showing, you know, warming up till this point, but then all of the future scenarios that we can choose from um, and how they'll affect, you know, people born today. Um, so what sort of future will people born this decade uh, grow up into? Uh, those, those different pathways are largely up to the actions that we choose to take individually and collectively. Um, and so I feel that we should all, or I'd like to encourage a lot of um, agency and engagement rather than, you know, doom, doomism and, uh, and cynicism around this. And I also think it's important to remember that a lot of, I mean, yes, we need to buckle up and there's going to be enormous damage and we shouldn't overlook that. But it's also true that we're now entering uh, like sort of the exponential curve of a lot of these changes. So, you know, solar and wind um, and other clean energy technologies um, have decreased by 90% or more. And they're even on that curve still. Uh, and there's more technology and the amount of money going into, um, you know, climate finance, uh, which is a broad term, but uh, is also uh, on that trajectory. And it's very hard for, for most people, for everyone really to intuit what change at an exponential, you know, pace looks like. And so I think our intuitions um, are not that useful in some senses because they're trained on the last 50 years where we've been essentially wasting time doing the things that need to be done, but also building towards this point right now. And so it's helpful to know that there are areas um, that are now, now are along the exponential curve. Well, others aren't, but um, that's gonna be hard, make it hard to predict or intuit what the next 10, 15 years will bring. I think it's interesting you bring up this exponential curve. Uh, we were getting a lot of questions by the way, and I'd like to, save uh, plenty of time for the audience. So one quick uh, question to bring us into our uh, questions for the audience uh, before we get to that point. Um, as you mentioned this exponential curve, what are the limitations going to be? What are the challenges going to be as we start to move into this? Uh, you mentioned the, the curve, Michael, specifically involving things like uh, solar and wind. Uh, where do you foresee, uh, both of you foresee us uh, running into uh, potential uh, hurdles. There's a lot. Um, do you want to take it, Erica? Do you? Why don't you take this one? Okay. <laughs> um, we're we're basically faced with the challenge of building out uh, the infrastructure of an entire industrial revolution that took more than a century in a matter of decades. And to get that much steel and cement in the ground and to transfer that old infrastructure, new infrastructure in that time period is, is obviously the massive challenge. I almost don't think it's the, act, it's the act of building that so much as the act of permitting it and getting approval and coordinating that across a society. Um, and you're seeing that more and more, like uh, there's been quite a, a few articles written about sort of the next phase of the environmental movement is overcoming nimbyism and essentially embracing the idea that we're going to build our way out of a lot of these problems, even while we conserve, you know, the natural areas that we have. And there's tension there. And so I think that that bit of it is going to be massive. And then, you know, the idea that we're going to be able to pull some of the carbon dioxide out of that out of the air, either through natural means or mechanical means, is both probably an essential is is an essential part of whatever um, path we take, and it also I think is one of the most difficult to figure out how that's going to work. Um, you know, can we really run the fossil fuel industry in reverse over the course of many years? Um, is a very open question. So um, you know, and then behavioral change is another one, um, which I think is an element of of this just as much as we need to shift the infrastructure, we need to shift kind of how people live. Um, and I don't mean sacrifice, but I think just getting used to a new and sometimes better way of doing things 
And sometimes, you know, there's there's trade-offs, but um, we've done it before. We've done it in the past. This country has electri electrified the entire nation. We built, you know, railroads across the continent. Like these things have been done. This is not impossible. It's just, can we do it today? Um, and, you know, given the constraints we have right now. Yeah, all, all great points and potential barriers. Um, and I think the, the point you led with about kind of the, the context that we're conceptualizing um, the scale and pace um, at which we need to decarbonize our entire economy, not just in the US, but globally, um, is it's difficult to do because it's something we've never really done, we've never done before, right? So it's all very unprecedented. Um, and so I, I do think that um, you know, uh, 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 you know, there there are these these behavioral barriers, and and part of it is is you know being able to conceive of the scale and and pace and and continued acceleration um, that we'll need to see um, in so many sectors in every sector of of the economy. So um, you know, I've seen specific uh, examples of. You know, we have this this huge influx of funding from the Inflation Reduction Act, for instance, um, to to help uh, cut emissions uh, and and bring the U.S. closer to its 2030 goals um, uh, to to cut emissions 50 percent relative to 2005 levels by 2030. Um, and uh, the I mean, yeah, I've, I've read a few pieces about um, just it's a it's a critical phase right now to make sure that the money begins flowing or continues to flow uh, to the projects that are going to, you know, make the biggest difference in in the nearest term. Right. So, um, yeah, I think all of those things are are potential barriers. And I'm sure there are more that we, you know, haven't even haven't even conceived of yet. Yeah, I think I think it's interesting because I, I think a lot of these barriers are starting to turn into kind of uh, actually advantages in the sense that it used to be much more expensive to, to do solar rather than coal and same for wind. And it used to be much more expensive to run an electric vehicle or build an electric vehicle than an ICE vehicle. And with each one of these technologies, we are now with subsidies well past that, that parity point and without subsidies actually well past that parity point in many cases. And so it's actually more expensive to do the carbon intensive thing than it was uh, than to do the other thing. And granted, there are vested interests that are going to fight until uh, the end to prevent that from happening. Um, but the, the, the fact that the dynamic now, the default now favors uh, low carbon uh, emissions in some cases is something that's new and I don't think we've fully appreciated yet. When you look at, you know, something on the order of, um, I think, you know, basically there's no new coal being built in the United States um, and almost all the new investments going to solar wind and in some cases natural gas. Um, but the, the number of natural gas plants that can compete with battery wind and solar is becoming vanishingly small uh, in the coming years. So I think, again, it's it's just, Hard to hard to hard to understand that um, sort of dynamic when all we've known is it's just cheaper to burn carbon. Mm -hmm. Right, and I, I another you know another thing another factor here is that there are so many co benefits to even just beginning with human health um, to decarbonizing the economy. So just with the example of you know transport, um, uh, the transportation sector. Uh, and and you know ad adopting electric vehicles in place of um, of fossil fuel powered vehicles and combustion engines uh, and and reducing overall demand has a huge benefit for uh, air quality in the, the air that that we breathe in our own neighborhoods. So and that's just one specific example, but uh, there are, are a lot of benefits sort of ancillary benefits to to doing this as well. And I think the more awareness we can raise about that, um, I think that kind of potentially helps uh, uh, 
with an inflection point in the behavior barriers that we mentioned before as well, because we really all stand to benefit um, a lot from, from adopting some of these solutions. Well, I think I really appreciate that we're getting a fuller picture of the, the climate crisis here going just beyond the headlines. And I hope we've uh, done a little bit more of that digging to be a little bit more than one inch deep, uh, even if we're maybe not a mile wide. We're gonna turn to some questions now uh, from the uh, from the audience. We're getting some good ones um, I'm seeing come in. Uh, we'll start with a, a big one and a really excellent, interesting question from Craig. Craig is a teacher at Fairfield University and Craig writes, as part of the national teach-in on climate a few weeks ago, I encouraged students to consider specific purchasing decisions they'll be making in the next five to 15 years. How big of a house and where to buy a house? What type of car to buy? How big of a family should I have? Do you think, um, Michael and Erica, do you think these are good questions to be asking students? This is sort of a two-part question. So the first part is, do you think these are good questions for students? And the second is, what other questions would you add? Let's, um, oh, whoever would like to take it. So I wrote something, uh, edited something uh, not long ago about how do you talk to your kids about climate change. And one of the things that came out of that was this idea that kids need to grieve, essentially, for what they're losing or what they've lost, um, and that they will not grow up in the same world that we grew up in. Um, and not that it's you know, doomed, but it is going to be poorer in many significant ways. And once they're able to do that, it actually allows them to act and to move forward in a way that if you do not confront that, I think it makes it harder to take those actions to even feel like this is, there is hope uh, in a way that encouraged me to, for example, have a family, which I don't think is something bad. You should, you should do that. If that's something that you want to do, I don't uh, see that as antithetical, essentially, to caring about the climate. Um, so I think maybe that's not like a question you should ask, but I think it's something you should talk about um, as well. Um, and then it's something I want to explore more, but one of the points that I think is interesting to make is when kids are young and they're living at home, or when they're in college even, and they're probably at the point of their life where they're consuming the least and living and um, sort of an interesting lifestyle that may never live again. And if you ask them, are you happy or do you enjoy this lifestyle? Because it will, it, it will probably not look like this in 10 or 20 years. And yet, you know, make sure I guess people are kind of chasing the right type of happiness and not just the, the sort of the right type of possessions or the right type of lifestyle. And I'm curious um, how powerful that could be going forward. And that's a long-term bet, but um, I think it's the question that you ask early that then can have a profound impact. Because I know when I kind of forgot about riding bicycles after college and I didn't do it for 10 years. And when I started doing it again, it was great because it was the best way to get around Washington, DC. Um, and not because of the climate, just because it was a better way of getting around in many cases. So. I think if I had been more, more um, thoughtful about how I was li living my life at any given time, uh, it would have been a, a powerful question to re-ask over time. I love that idea. Um, basically asking the students, what do you like, what do you like to do? How do you like to spend your time? Yeah. Um, and how will that inform your future? And broad more broadly, I mean, I think it's um. I think posing these questions to students uh, about their future, their future choices. Um, and I think in the examples given um, from the listener, uh, primarily sort of about consumption, um, you know, these are things that we all should be thinking about. Um, uh, and um, I think this goes to some of the agency that I, um, that I think that I, I would hope that we can all in our, in our lives, uh, feel empowered to feel, um, uh, that, that in our, in our personal lives, we do have the power to make a difference and, uh, and make choices that we enjoy, uh, in the case of, you know, riding our bicycle, 
um, and that make sense for the world that we want to be living in um, and that are consistent with that. But I think these are things that, um, that we all need to be thinking about, certainly. And this is inspiring me to uh, go get my bike out because, well, weather's starting to get a little bit better, uh, get a little bit of rain coming. But after that, I think it's bike season. Uh, we have next a question from Jeremy. How do we create space for communities of color to have confidence around climate science? It's a really important question we've been asking ourselves at WSHU. What's your take? I think, you know, what, what we try to do at the Post and wherever I've worked is find voices in the communities that are most affected and give them the voice essentially through whatever stories that we're trying to tell. Um, and I don't mean speak for them, I mean just let those, let those people tell those stories. Um, and I think that we do often default to sort of the sources that have been cited before um and those are often aren't the most diverse group of people that you can find um from their background their race or what have you so um it does require a subconscious effort to to go out and and to find them and so we've you know we've i can tell you that we've made that effort multiple times in the course of my career where we you know we we, we make um you know a, a conscious effort before a story starts to to find those sources and then make it a habit so um, that's my best answer for now. Yeah, and I, at, at Climate Central, uh, with our Climate Matters reporting resources, um, these are really weekly resources that are meant to, again, bring global climate change down to the local level and make it very accessible for, um, for a, a general, general reader. Um, and it's also, possibly, hopefully, even a segue for individuals to dive into the science and the data themselves. Uh, we cite a lot of sources that are openly accessible. Um, and I think that we're, we're all fortunate to live in, uh, in, a, in a country that's very data rich, um, especially when it comes to uh, local weather station data, um, temperature trends, rainfall trends, um, and a lot of this data is accessible through NOAA, EPA, um, and even just in the last couple of years, um, the, the federal government has been launching, um, uh, I don't have the, the links up right now, but um, I think the, it, there are some like multi-agency platforms, um, a new environmental justice screening tool that brings a lot of this data um, that the federal government has that's really high quality data down to the local level. Um, and I think part of what Climate Matters hopes to do is to bring people along um, to uh, feel empowered uh, to engage personally um, with data at the local level to tell stories in, and, and, and yeah, to, to be able to use data to, to bring to, um, local storytelling about climate impacts and climate solutions. Um, another way that we do this is we have another core program at Climate Central, our partnership journalism program. So a lot of the local analyses that we, we, uh, we run week in and week out, um, they're, they're just the tip of the iceberg, right? So um, the data, you know, powerful trends speak for themselves in, in these data. Um, but the real stories lie in the local communities that are being affected by trends in rainfall, extreme temperature, uh, more severe weather outbreaks. Um, and so our partnerships journalism program partners with, uh, with local reporters in, in local communities to bring out um, voices and perspectives. Um, and there's, a, there's a, a concerted effort in our partnership journalism program to partner with uh, communities who are disproportionately affected or um, or you know more more vulnerable or have less adaptive capacity uh, for historic and for historical reasons um, to adapt to some of uh, some of the changes that we're seeing at the local level. 
Well, we have a lot of questions coming in right now. I'm very excited about this. We got a lot of discussion going on. So we, uh, we're, I'm gonna uh, ask one now from, uh, I, hope, I, I hope I'm saying your name right, Bettina, um, who asks, decarbonizing means electrifying by and large. Is our electrical system ready for that? And is it even cleaner? Um, it's definitely cleaner. So uh, with very few exceptions, unless you're driving a hum an electric Hummer, you're emitting less few, less emissions by charging your EV. Like we can just put that aside. Uh, you are you are better off uh, charging your car than refueling your car. Um, of course, that changes vastly between states. So if you're in the Pacific Northwest or in Quebec or in certain parts of um, uh, you know very wind and solar heavy regions, it's going to be cleaner than it is in Kentucky. Um, that's that's absolutely true. But uh, overall, um, you are you are better off charging your EV, assuming you're not driving the Hummer EV. And in terms of what can we build, um, this is I think when you look back at how much uh, capacity and transmission we built in between you know the 1900s uh, up to 1970, uh, we need to do that again. But it's it's not something that hasn't been done before um, in in rough terms. Uh, it just hasn't been done with wind and solar and in our current political and economic environment. So, um, you know, if you're if you're if you're thinking about buying a new car, the EV is often the way to go. Um, but depending on you know where you live, uh, in terms of your lifestyle, but but from an environmental perspective, it makes sense. And I, you know, I noticed we were uh, getting a, a lot of questions along those lines. Of people yeah. really wondering about EVs. You know, are they uh, are they cleaner? Um, I think I even saw something uh, a, while we've been talking. I just got an alert from uh, a story in the post. Yeah, uh, we we just wrote a big feature on this on the downsides, which is the battery packs are, are have a supply chain that is pretty dirty in the sense that we have to mine these uh, minerals in places that don't have great environmental safeguards. So it's not a perfect process. Um, from an energy perspective, we're still ahead, um, but uh, we do need to clean up those supply chains as well. And so the, in, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, puts billions of dollars essentially to bring those supply chains into either North America or in countries where we have free trade agreements um, that have environmental labor standards. And so it is moving in the right direction, but Every decision has a series of trade-offs. Um, it's just that worrying about, you know, is my electricity, you know, more carbon intensive than my gasoline is not the top of your list because <laughs> it just usually isn't true in any case. Um, uh, on the same theme, uh, I'm gonna, this, this question is going to touch on a lot of the same things, but I think it will take us in an interesting direction. Uh, from here is a springboard. It's from uh, Jane Neal. Jane asks, uh, our family has one EV and is waiting for our second EV. What distresses me is that we use electricity to power these cars, but most of our electricity is still created by burning coal. Uh, we're in familiar uh, discussion territory here. When do you think we will have either wind or solar as the main source of electricity? Um, did she say where she is, where she lives? Uh, I, I I don't have that. Um, if uh, I, I'm perhaps we could get that as an addendum in the q and I'm not sure, Jane, if you'd like to add um, that information, you, uh, you're welcome to, but. It, it's, I guess, if you look at it from a national point of view, you know, the, the country is committed under the Biden administration to have a clean grid um, by, I believe, 2045, I want to say. I have to double check that. But essentially, by mid-century, um, we should be close to net zero, if not surpassed, net zero car, um, electricity supply. Um, so you can pin your hat on, on that if you believe it. Um, but it's going to progress at different rates in different parts of the country. And not every you know grid is going to clean up as fast as the others. So I think it's going to be decades, not years, to get to net to get to a clean electricity supply. But it will be every year. the The U.S. electricity grid does get cleaner. Um, and like I said, it is cheaper now to build wind and solar than it is a new gas or coal plant. So um, by economics alone, even before the Inflation Reduction Act, we were moving in that direction. And uh, we have learned that Jane lives right here in Fairfield, Connecticut, uh, where yeah. we're based here at WSHU. Um, uh, we can lead this next question with you, Erica, if you like. 
Uh, what role will changes in agriculture play in climate action, in your opinion? Well, uh, agriculture is a, a major contributing sector of greenhouse gas emissions in the US. I think it makes up about 10% of the nation's emissions, according to EPA data. Um, and part of agricultural emissions are tied to demand. So what are our diets uh, comprised of and how uh, carbon intensive is the production um, and distribution of those food products. Um, so diet plays a role in agricultural emissions, and that's that's one lever that or one knob that we can turn. Um, and then the other uh, is the you know on farm production and agricultural practices. Um, so we at Climate Central we've had a couple of uh, solutions briefs recently about um, soil carbon um, and not just agricultural soils but also uh, wetlands and forested landscapes and grasslands, but um, agricultural soils and uh, climate smart agricultural practices that um, that reduce carbon uh, emissions from from farm practices into the atmosphere um, can also sort of are another knob that we can turn. But um, I think that uh, yeah. I, there, there need to be proper in incentives in place, I believe, um, to to help farmers along in that transition. Michael, anything you'd like to uh, add to that point? No, I think that I covered it. Uh, our next question is uh, from Michelle, and it's about composting. Composting kitchen scraps or food waste seems like such low hanging fruit to lower emissions. What will it take to scale municipal composting? This one's very important in my household. What will it take to scale municipal composting and make it the norm? It's a great question. Um, I actually wrote about this. Um, it's surprisingly cheap. It was less, it was in the tens, if not hundreds, maybe hundreds, but I think it was tens of millions of dollars to scale up a municipal composting um, supply uh, uh, sort of system uh, in many cases. Um, Here's where I think we're going. Basically, in places like the Northeast and even in the Pacific Northwest, you've already seen uh, composting mandates. I think Vermont, actually, you're, you, you're not supposed to throw any organic waste into your trash. It all needs to go to either a backyard composter, which have become very good. Um, they actually can uh, sit in the ground. You just throw them in. And I think it's called the green cone. You should check it out. And it essentially digests all of your compost um, without you having to do like a, a, an actual bin. Um, or you or you have to drop it off. So I think there's gonna be states that just pass laws um, that divert this compost from the supply, from the supply, uh, the regular waste stream. Um, and then we're gonna to move towards, um, I think much better sorting, like one stream sorting around the country. We're already seeing that with recycling. And um, yeah, it'll, it'll basically, I think go state by state and it's going to take quite some time, but as states prove out the economics and the feasibility of this, I think you're going to see it move much faster than, than you expect to the point where the same way that we, we sort of expect to recycle or have some sort of recycling with our trash these days, um, I think we're going to get there with organic waste. Um, I know San Francisco already does this and it's, it's, an, it's not, not, it's like, it's just normal. Uh, and I read any time I go anywhere else, it obviously isn't, but I do think I do think we're, because there's so much emissions associated with it, I think we're gonna get there faster than we think. Erica, would you like to add anything to that point? I don't have anything further to add, no. Well, folks, we are uh, we have gone through a lot of questions here. If we have any more questions from the audience, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'd love to get a few more questions from you. Um, let me ask the two of you, while. Uh, we're waiting on more questions. Uh, what is it that makes uh, each of you uh, hopeful? I mean, do, do you see, uh, as a journalist, I'm often thinking this question, right? What kind of reporting, and I know both of you work in that field as well, so I'm sure you're thinking the same thing. What kind of reporting do you see that that uh, makes you hopeful? What kind of news do you like to see? Good question. 
I like seeing all news about climate change. I think we're seeing upticks in coverage of climate change um, and more so about solutions all the time. Um, I think a lot of climate coverage in the past um, or historically has been primarily focused on impacts, but um, I think Michael's column at the Washington Post is a great example of, you know, increasing, increasingly readers want to, uh, and the, the general public wants to know about climate change, how it's affecting them, and also what they can do about it. So, I mean, I, I love seeing all kinds of climate reporting, truly. Um, I, I think it's all part of, it all kind of comes back to normalizing the conversation, uh, educating people, and uh, also empowering people to feel that they, you know, this is, this is not just a far off issue that doesn't affect them, but um, something that they can indeed have personal agency in. Yeah, that's she. I think you nailed it. Uh, you know, I, I I've been reporting on this for a long time, and I think for the first ten or fifteen years, it was something that lived in the science page, or it was on the political page occasionally. And the fact that a it's being covered at all, which was not the case for a long time, and b that it is now just part, it is like central to most media publications' coverage is a sea change and I don't think you can underestimate how powerful that is because it seems like you know it's everywhere for us because we're probably reading about it all the time but for a lot of people it's still not part of their daily life although it's that's changing and so when I see it on television as often as I see it in print then I think I will I will say okay we've arrived we haven't we're not quite there yet but I, I don't think we're far off um and the second thing is the type of the type of stories that I see, you know, the IRA, that was dead on arrival. There was no hope for that passing. And then it did. And I think there's probably going to be a lot more stories like that. And every time I see one of those, um, it just shows that we just we just can't predict the, the type of breakthroughs that can happen, um, you know, every every day. Um, and so I think. Um, no matter how bad the news gets, we do see those stories regularly and more so now. So I think that's uh, another encouraging sign in a relatively dark time. We are getting a lot of great new questions coming in. Thank you all. We are definitely, we're getting that second win. We're getting a new round, a bunch of new good questions. Here's one that it's pretty close to home, literally, uh, for a lot of folks in Connecticut uh, around here. How harmful are lawn and gardening practices? So, do you want to go, Erica? Or should I? Um, I'll let you take this. Okay, I um I, I'm writing about this right now. I haven't finished it. Um, so we're in the middle of you know one of the largest extinction events um, for millions of years, and it may turn into the sixth largest ever uh, in biological history. Um, and one of the major problems is a lack of habitat. And you don't think of your lawn as habitat, but that's exactly what it is. And we've decided uh, for some reason um, that we want a, a species of grass to live there uh, at the exclusion of every other species, um, which, is everyone's right to do, but <laughs> it's actually interesting if you would, uh, it's not so much practices per se, um, but if you thought of your lawn as habitat, how would you do it differently? And I don't mean just for, for animals and, and insects and plants, but for yourself um, and what's optimal in that case. And can you spare a strip that just, you just reseed with natives? Um, can you actually take out some of the evasives and add more natives? Um, you don't need to rip up your entire lawn and, and put in a native plant garden, although you're, that's great, but um, can you find a place for wildlife to live? Because I promise you, if you even give it just, just a, a strip, uh, it, will, it will very soon become something that you probably couldn't have imagined. Um, there's an app I just wrote about, there's several apps I've wrote, written about recently, and they're basically AI naturalists. They use artificial intelligence to identify species they're phenomenal. Um, it's called Seek. Um, one other one's called iNaturalist. Another one's called PlantNet. 
And then Merlin, Merlin is a bird ID and it just listens and you can actually identify all the birds around you in real time, it just shows you. So um, if you go out on your lawn with Seek, which is essentially a video app and you just point it at different plants, you can actually identify what's going on. And as soon as you learn what's back there, it changes your whole relationship with, I think your own space and those species and what's possible. So um, if there was, one of the things I would recommend everyone is listening, go out is download that app and just check out what's living behind your backyard or around you. And I think very soon you'll appreciate about what's possible in terms of you returning. Even just one native plant is actually a food for 10 other native insects and, and therefore other animals. And so, um, yeah, experiment. Just if, if it kills, you know, if you're putting poison on your lawn, it, you're poisoning, you know, you're poisoning the rest of, of that area too. So uh, find a way to maybe take a step back from that space and then see what grows. All wonderful yeah. points. And I would just add um, my growing awareness of the emissions from uh, lawn care equipment, um, like leaf blowers. Um, I, you know, just, just from reading some reporting about it um, recently, but uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's really the only thing I, I would add to what Michael said. Um, as a, uh, not to editorialize too much in my part, but as a someone who's always felt that the tightly shorn lawn was a little arbitrary, I'm, I'm happy to hear these things. I, I like to see a little bit of shag uh, growing on a lawn, and I like to see some bees and bugs around. Doesn't bother me a bit. Uh, a question from our general manager, uh, Rima: uh, What about the impact of climate change to poorer countries that don't have agency like we have? With well, countries at ocean levels like. Thailand or Tuvalu really disappear? It's a sobering and a very good question. Well, um, I can start on that one. Uh, it is absolutely true um, that, you know, the, the impacts and the historical responsibility for climate change are, not, are both unequally distributed across the planet. Um, and a lot of the the risks and impacts that we face in the U.S. look a little different because um, because of our our what our relative wealth and adaptive capacity. Um, uh, that said, you know, the U.S. does bear historical responsibility for a lot of the the cumulative greenhouse gas emissions that are warming our planet, um, and so the U.S. as well as other wealthy countries. Um, uh, you know, through the through the UN climate negotiations, um, are you know are negotiating ways that through loss and damage agreements um, we can be held accountable um, in a fair and transparent way um, to to address these inequitable distribute dis inequitably distributed uh, risks and impacts from climate change, not just. Uh, not just within our countries, but globally. Um. Yeah, it, it's 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 hard to over to overstate the injustice. I think of climate impacts and you know who's produced them and, and who suffers. So um, you are correct. I don't have any good answers to that, unfortunately. Uh, here's one uh, from uh, Carl who asks, is there a significant difference from an environmental impact between a vegan versus a vegetarian diet? I, um, I might uh, add as well um, my own curiosity on this, uh, or an omnivorous diet. Obviously, we have a few different options here. Uh, is there a significant, a significant difference from an environmental impact? Um, I'm going to write a column about that. Um, let's see. So I think I'm not going to answer that directly. Um, but what I will say is I think the 80, 20 or 90, 10 rule applies here, which is that you get 80% of your results from 20% of the effort. And so, you know, we can argue about veggie or vegan or omnivore, but the reality is, is you're going to get most of your benefits in that first chunk of you know dietary changes uh for example 
I think reducing, let's say reducing your meat and dairy intake by 10% is going to have, I think, a 30% impact, if not more, on, on the missions associated with that diet. Um, so, you know, I think the important thing, I think we get caught up in the extremes, um, like how far can we take it? And that's great. And if you're there, that's great. But I think for most people, the they don't re, we don't realize that it's like these small initial steps are just have a huge effect um, um, going forward. And it's it's not that it's actually not just uh, you know emissions. It's also envi environmental health uh, generally and your own personal health. Um, and it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It's very much um, you know every degree every. You know, every hot dog or not hot dog eaten. <laughs> um, yeah, not much to add to what Michael said, but um, we do have a lot of great uh, data and science about different uh, different food products and their uh, their impact, not just from a global warming perspective, but also environmentally. Um, and so we can all, as individuals, refer to that and make the decisions that we feel are are right for us. But again, we we live in a really data rich um, age uh, and time with increasingly accessible science um, on all of these questions that um, I'd really encourage people to uh, to find primary sources for and and look into and, and make decisions that that feel like a fit for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, meat and dairy are are the big ones that Michael mentioned. And it's actually yeah, and it's specifically beef, like you know, lamb ruminants, like that's that's just going to be a, a massive um, impact. So yeah. uh, if that's something you're concerned about, you know, just not eating one hamburger a week actually is a big deal. So. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been a fantastic conversation. We've touched on a lot of topics here. We've gone through composting, bicycles. Uh, meat consumption, and we have one last question. We're going to end with this one, and I think it's a perfect question to end with because it's straight to the point. We're not going to ask you about any specific issue, any specific topic, any specific practice. We're going to open it up to you. The question is from Ted, who asks, what is the easiest thing anyone can do now to have an impact? Very straightforward. What is the easiest thing anyone can do now to have an impact? So that's actually a column I want to write to. Um, and I haven't figured it out, but I will say this. 50% um, of your, a huge percent of your emissions essentially comes um, associated with you, comes from heating and cooling your house. Uh, it's just, there's very few things that are as energy intensive as trying to keep your house between 65 and 74. Um, and uh, something that I have realized I didn't do that I could do that will pay for itself in seven days, maybe 14, is to buy a little strip that goes under your door that basically prevents that draft. Because a lot of older homes basically don't have those weather strips. Um, and they're so cheap and you just get them from Home Depot, you put them on and then essentially they pay for themselves almost immediately. So uh, it's small and it sounds trivial, but actually it makes a huge difference um, in the comfort of your house and then just your costs. And I also think once you start doing those little things that matter, uh, it just leads you down uh, a road of, oh, I can do that. And I can do the next thing and the next thing. So um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, yeah, you can do that, but you can probably pick anything. And as long as you're doing the thing, it just tends to lead on to the next, so. Um, I, I love that response. And also I, I'm gonna just echo myself and say that the one thing you can do right now for free is talk about climate change. Um, because if, if doing so um, helps your neighbor, acquaintance, coworker, uh, you know, it, shift their behavior in some way or um, adopt some some uh, practice or or uh, or support climate action um, more directly you know again the the individual actions that we as as people living in the United States um, a relatively wealthy uh, 
uh, high consuming country with relatively high per capita, uh, you know, carbon uh, greenhouse gas emissions, every little action that we take really has a big impact, a big relative impact. And so again, like it's, it's free, it's really easy to do. It might feel uncomfortable in certain situations, but if you can talk about climate change more often, um, it you may you know it can have surprising surprising effects. We're we're all we're all social social creatures working through this together, right? So that's what I. Think I better than my answer. Listen, listen to what she said. That's good. <laughs> well, I think that's sort of the theme of this whole conversation and i hope that one of the things that comes out of this is that we go and talk about it more having heard this conversation we go have our own conversations so thank you both so much michael thank you for the preview of your next 20 columns i think we covered everything you have coming up uh there and uh erica thank you so much for uh for joining us uh both of you uh, a, a real honor to have you here i'll turn it back over to our news director terry sheridan <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed tonight's conversation. I know I did because it was not only informative, but it was uh, enjoyable. I mean, it was a, it was it was a really great conversation. So I'd like to thank both uh, Dr. Erica Frymuth and Michael Corrin for participating. WSHU will be reporting on climate extensively this year, so I hope you tune into WSHU, frequent our website, use our app, and I hope you reach out to us if you have more questions or more feedback about this or any other topics that you hear at WSHU. We especially want to hear your opinion and your thoughts as we move forward with the climate beacon. So we'd like to thank Farrah Warner and Solutions Journalism for their support uh, in our quest here. And WSHU is on the campus of Sacred Heart University in Fairfield. So we thank them for their support. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for listening. And thank you for supporting WSHU. And have a great night.